Welcome to the podcast of MotorWeek, television's original automotive magazine. MotorWeek is made possible by TireRack.com, WeatherTech, RockAuto.com, and State Farm. Here's your MotorWeek podcast host, John Davis. Thank you, Alec Webb, and welcome everyone to Motor Week Podcast, wait for it, number 200. Yay! We have reached the uh, 200 mark, uh, and it's very significant that sitting around our table in uh, Motor Week Headquarters Studio C today is writer-producer Brian Robinson. Hello, John. Our online content coordinator, Greg Carlos. I can't believe I was here at 100. Yeah, and our video producer and editor and the producer of the podcast, Joe Ligo. Hey, thanks, guys. And uh, Brian Robinson was the uh, only one here that was uh, at the table today that was here when we did the very first podcast uh, way back on September 3rd, 2008, so a little over um, 10 years ago. I remember it it very well. Um, Podcasts were still relatively new at that point. Uh, Bob Mixter, who was the creator of the idea of the podcast, went to Michelle Parker, our publicist. They talked about it. They came in and twisted my arm, and I said, really? And we started doing the podcast and haven't looked back, and it was uh, a pretty – fortuitous event because now I think I personally think we were the first of the mainstream automotive media that were doing podcasts and we went on to do video podcasts for a while and uh, now virtually everybody does them you can't hardly go into any podcast uh, archive without that but just to refresh everybody's memory and Joe jump in here anytime because you've actually yeah I, at the I went back and listened, listened to the, the first one. couple podcasts from back in the day uh, gas four bucks a gallon so today at least around here it's about half that uh, of course at four bucks a gallon you talk a lot about fuel economy uh, we had just finished driving the hydrogen power Chevy Equinox. Wonder where that one is. Uh, the Cadillac CTSV, which is uh, going away in favor of SUVs, and I guess the only one that's still viable that we talked about then is the Honda Fit, which was new then. Uh, we also talked about the rising popularity of three-wheeled auto cycles, like the Cam Am Spider. Wonder what uh, they're still out there, but I think we're still sort of talking about them in the same, uh, you know, maybe in the future. Uh, we went around the table. Uh, we talked about. Uh, uh, everything that was pertinent to the day. So let me throw this out this is our first. Uh, well, first, before we get that, there's one other person who was in on the very first podcast. Mm. And that is the gentleman that we talk about his name a lot, but you never get to hear. And that's our audio engineer, Jim Bigwood. Jim, you back there in the control room? Yes, I am. Now, Jim was the audio engineer on the very first podcast. So what's your recollection, Jim? I remember when you came to me in the summer of 2008 and said, hey, we're thinking about doing a podcast. Do you think you could do something like that? And I thought back to my early days in broadcasting when I started in radio. (laughs) And it was just a bunch of guys sitting around a table talking into microphones. And I said to you, yeah, I think I can do this. (laughs) It's gone full circle, hasn't it? Yes. I mean, that's exactly what we're doing when I worked in my college radio station. That was kind of like uh, you'd had the big table and four or five microphones and whatever you were going to talk about, you talked about. It It didn't really matter if it was formal. But yeah, Jim's probably done the audio for more podcasts than anybody in this building. Easily, easily. easily. He's he's our go-to guy. But it's funny, I went back and listened to those early podcasts, and one thing that stuck out to me... Everybody was really excited. We had just driven. And we're the, not now. Is the, that it? No, no. We're still excited. But you were really excited. Everybody had just driven the new Volkswagen TDI that was 50 state legal. <laughs> and we we're all talking about how amazing it was. It met all oh, these emission standards and all this stuff. And I just thought, man, <laughs> if only we could. Nobody knew. Uh, how could how you know? Is, well, yeah, I mean, a lot has happened in 10 years. And maybe that's where we ought to start. Brian Robinson. Uh-oh. Last 10 years in this business, does anything jump out at you that you didn't think was going to happen or you did think was going to happen and it did? Um, yeah, I think the general uh, electrification of cars, the full EVs, is still uh, slower to trickle out than what we were thinking at the time. Mm-hmm. They are, you know, more and more cars or plug-ins are coming out, but maybe not as quickly as, as what I thought at the time. Um, you know, we were all small cars for a while. 
Uh, now we're all big SUVs again. Yeah. So <laughs> everything better. Yeah, everything is cyclical. Greg, you were a puppy at that <laughs> yeah, point. Yeah, I was in college, man. Yeah. I was just looking at that. Um, yeah, as far as car design, it's, you know, in a decade didn't used to be that long of a time in car design, but now we're talking about total redesigns within half that time. Mm-hmm. So I'm thinking of cars, how we've gone from, we were still kind of in that nice flowing rounded edge phase. We were right. getting out of it. Now we're into like the super sharp angles. Look no further than Lexus, Hack and Nissan, slash, style, yeah, yeah. all of them. And uh, yeah, I mean, I was, I was a fan of the more rounded stuff, but I have started coming around on some of the more angular stuff. Uh, you know, but uh, yeah, um, uh, on Robinson's point, I feel like it's easy to think that the electrification has come out slow in cars, but if you do step back and look at all the electrification that is out there, it is quite a bit. I mean, yeah, between hybrids and 48 volt electrical systems and, and of course the pure EVs, it, but, but I, it has – I mean, we've been talking about electric cars on Motor Week since I think 1983 was the first one we ever did. So for 35 years, we've been saying it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Now it, it finally is. When do you think we'll say it's here? I mean, yeah, is, I you know, is it here? What worries me is that right now you have certain governments in the world like the Chinese and to some extent the Europeans that are, are pushing towards all electric vehicles – and they're going to pretty much force people to buy them. That, excuse me, that's not going to happen probably in this country. And so what's going to happen here, and I'm just talking about the U.S., is you've got all these cars that are going to be coming on the market for global consumption. And I'm afraid that Americans are going to either turn up their noses at them or they're going to have such poor resale value that it's going to spoil the the march towards electrification because there's a lot of situations like as your second car for a commuter car that they make superb sense for. Then the other thing is, of course, infrastructure. Can you imagine having enough charging stations to match the number of cars out there, say, if they really started selling at a million a year? I don't see plans for that. So I think all of that could sour the American appetite. And you may go from a lot of them coming out in the next few years to where there'd be some form of retrenchment. Maybe you'd have electrified, you know, more hybrids, but not as many plug-ins. We'll have to cover so, that in the next 10 years yeah. of podcasting. The, uh, I'm going to answer that question myself, and then, Joe, I'll let you have a go at it. I didn't think that SUVs would take over the market. I thought they were a growing section. But really – sedans collapsed within the last three years. It was just like one day they were selling well, and, and the next month, it was actually July or June, of like three years ago, they just went away. And I didn't think that was going to happen. But I think that if you ask me what was the biggest change in automobiles uh, in 10 years, I think it has to be all the advanced safety systems. Uh, you know, all the stuff that's been made possible by this march towards autonomous vehicles, which is another thing that's probably not going to come qu- as quick as a lot of people would want. But the automatic braking, the bi- blind spot monitoring, the rear cross traffic alert. Cameras on every side Cameras of the car. everywhere, the 360. When I saw Nissan took us to a lab and showed us their 360 camera routine, we thought, why do you need that? You know, one in the back is enough. Well, guess what? Now every um, car has Now it's it. like yeah. you almost – how quickly – we get used to that yeah, stuff too. Yeah. So, so technology has certainly marched forward, Joe. Yeah, the, the now, I should thing, say this going in. Joe is our classic car guru. So stuck in the past. Yeah, yeah. No, no, well, I'm not so sure. <laughs> of that. But uh, I, I love looking back on on car history. The big thing I think of is just all the corporate shakeups. I mean, 2008 was the height of the big bailouts, and you know, Chrysler was at death's door, and as you was know, GM. I, and, and I don't think Tesla had even built a single car yet. I think and they just, had the Roadster, I think. Maybe. You know, they, they were did, struggling they to get had. that into production. So just the n- amount of corporate changes. I mean, we still had Saturn and Mercury and Pontiac yeah. back then, and now in Hummer and Saab. So just the corporate shakeups and stuff, it's crazy to think about how much that stuff has changed. Do you think that's going to continue? I don't know. I mean, with with Nissan Renault's situation with their CEO guy getting booted, I mean, I th- I think in Ford and Volkswagen partnering up on stuff, I think there's going to be lots of corporate shakeups in the future. And then with China, it's a whole other story. But yeah. I mean, we could spend the whole podcast predicting the future and still get it wrong. 
Jim, are you still there? Yes, I am. All right, what's Thank the goodness. what's the biggest uh, change in automobiledom that you have seen that affects you as a consumer? And I have to say that Jim is is uh, he's he produces uh, audio for a lot of shows here, and so he's not just stuck in gear with us. I would probably say the rise of hybrids out there. There was not as many on the roads then. And the fact that the almost everybody now, when they launch a new model, they, they either say, we've got one coming or we've got one here. Right, well. a hybrid version yeah. will be on sale soon. Well, I predicted back then that if you really looked at the whole electrification thing, you know, a hybrid like a Prius or whatever you want to say today, maybe a plug-in hybrid, uh, makes the most sense because you don't need special infrastructure. So... Thank you all. That was fun. Looking yeah. back over 200 podcasts and 10-plus and years, a lot has changed, and we hope you'll all stick around with us as we go ahead and hit, heading towards that 300 mark. Uh, I don't think it'll take us five years to get there, but who knows? Anyway, we do have some current events that we want to talk about, some vehicles that we've either just finished testing or actually have in our shop right now. Uh, we're going to start with one we recently had down at our winter testing track, Rolling Road Raceway, down in Savannah, Georgia. That's the uh, revamped Acura NSX for 2019. Uh, in case you uh, are not up to speed on it, uh, three and a half liter V6 hybrid. It's got two electric motors in front and uh, one in the back. It's got a nine speed twin cuts transmission, zero to 60 in 3.1 seconds. Okay. What did you – I've got both Brian and Greg that drove the car extensively at the track. What did you think? Uh, relatively minor updates as far as it goes, but it's only been out for two years. So uh, basically they just, the standard tires are upgraded, although we didn't have those. We had the uh, upgraded Pirellis anyway and uh, some software updates. Uh, they claim it's two seconds quicker around their test track. Um, That's a lot. We uh, – the NSX, I mean, it's still the same deal. It uh, goes about its business with robotic precision, and uh, sometimes you don't feel like you're in total control of it, but it still slices around the track like nothing else, that's for sure. I think it was the fastest. I think I drove that car the fastest I've ever driven any car the first time I got in, and it was at um, a racetrack out in, on the West Coast. And I've never driven a car that made you feel like you were that good of driver. You know, it, mm. it's like, wow, I think I'm Pirelli Jones here, but Pernelli Jones, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Pirelli Jones. Actually, I was about to say this, yeah. essentially the same thing. Um, you get up to speed very quickly in that car. It's easy to drive it fast, extremely well balanced. Like Brian said, there's a ton of electronics going on. If you really, if you've driven a lot of cars, you can kind of sense what's going on. Uh, but if you just hop in this thing and you're a casual driver, you're like, wow, this is incredible. I can do anything I want. Um, the, you know, it's weird. I think I fell kind of victim to a lot of other people's opinions, souring mine on the NSX. Cause I don't know yeah, why a lot of supercar people out there that have hated the car from, yeah. And, and I don't, I don't know why I went in thinking I'm just not going to like it. And then I really sat down and thought about it. And I think it was a lot of just other people and maybe fans who haven't driven the car who were just like hating on it because Peer it's pressure. new. Right. Uh, but driving, it's a different story. Now I will say, um, if you're into stuff like engine sound, if you're on the outside of the car, you're going to probably be disappointed. But on the yeah. inside, and Robinson can attest to it. Yeah. It sounds, it sounds great. Good. Yeah, it's artificial, all manufactured, yeah. you know that. But yeah, it sounds so great. You yeah, get over every, it Everybody quick. says it sounds better inside the car than well, out. it does. And, it you know, does. I was in control of the flags at Roebling when it was doing laps, and I'd hear it come by, and I thought, man, that is such a disappointing engine note. But then everybody who got out of it is like, man, that thing sounds great inside. So I guess it's it's definitely for the driver, not for the passerby. It's so it's so capable, though, and just like Greg was saying, just instantly started pushing it. But I found myself, like, not paying attention to stuff because yeah. it's just so easy to drive. You know, it's like you're in a Lexus tooling down to the mall or whatever, and then you're like, realize you're coming up on a corner, and it's like, wow, but yeah. all the electronics. <laughs> and triple digit kick speeds in and, and like, yeah, whoa. You scoot right through like nothing <laughs> happened. Uh, the Acura NSX, and a relative bargain now with uh, so much of the stuff that used to be optional standard, 160000 That's a lot of money for me, but it's not a lot of money for somebody in that market. So. 
Okay, let's move on to something a little less pricey, uh, the 2019 Lexus UX. This is a subcompact Lexus SUV, the first one time they've put their toe into this market. Uh, a two-liter, uh, normally aspirated engine, 169 horsepower. They also have a hybrid version. Uh, it's an urban uh, crossover without any question. So, those of you that have had a chance to drive it so forth, I've sat in it. I've been around it. I was where uh, at the auto show when they unveiled it. Strikes me as kind of small for me, but what do you think about the market it's aimed this, at? This is like a Buick Encore size yeah. kind of thing, and but maybe a little more tracks. luxurious. Yeah, it's based on the Toyota CHR, which you can only get as front-wheel drive. It's very, very bare bones. Yeah, this one you can get all-wheel drive, but only if you get the hybrid where you get the uh, Toyota rear uh, electric motor all-wheel drive. If you remember the CT200H Lexus, uh, this is basically a new version of that, but since people don't buy hatchbacks, they do buy SUVs, SUVs. Um, then that's that's what it is. Is it about the same size or is it a little bit smaller? Than the CT or the yeah, CHR? the CT. Um, I would say it's about the same size space wise inside, but you know it's, it's jacked Tall, up a little just bit. Just taller, yeah. but, it, but even, yeah, even still, it doesn't ride all that high. And I noticed that cleaning off snow yesterday. I cleaned off my wife's CX nine, and then I turned around to go clean off the UX, and, and it's, it's like yeah, I'm like it's like, down like at the it. BMW X one sort yeah. of as but far as height. It, yeah, you know. Um, I liked it. I, I drove it a lot this weekend, and once you get yourself in, it's small. It's not for everybody, uh, but I had a great time in the in the hybrid. I thought it rode well. Um, fuel economy was okay for me, but it was also very cold, and I let it run sometimes. Um, mm-hmm. So I noticed the engine was on a lot more than other hybrids, but a comfortable cruiser, it's – all right, so there's fake yeah, audio coming about that. Oh, it's yeah. so obvious. That. And it's it's – it's a little bit annoying once you hear it for the first time, uh, but here's something even a little bit more silly, is I took it to the track, and so when you take off, you hear the natural engine noise, but then at about like, I don't know, 30 to 40 miles per hour, then you hear a very obvious computer-generated engine, engine sound, sound through come the through the speakers, <laughs> and what's even worse is this thing has a CVT, which does not shift gears. The engine sound coming through the speakers shifts gears. Oh, come <laughs> on. But I'm looking at the tack, and it's not moving at all. Oh, come on. That's just insulting your intelligence. <laughs> yeah, that so, it's, when I was so. driving it on the street, I was playing around with the different drive modes, you know, eco mode or whatever, and as soon as I put it into sport mode, it vroom, I'm like... This is not the end. I was coasting. I was going downhill. <laughs> yeah, and you put it in sport mode and the speakers just start blasting fake engine noise into the cab. I don't know if that's just like an F sport thing, but that's what we uh, have. And yeah, it's they could probably dial that back a little bit. But I <laughs> but I'll be honest, I really did enjoy driving it for the weekend. You know, it was really designed as much for American city streets that are often clogged uh, as it was for uh, going out on a European country road, which you know for is traditionally about a lane and a half at most wide and and pretty twisty with no markings. So I really felt, and they debuted it in Europe first, that this was really more aimed at sort of capturing a slice of the uh, growing SUV market in Europe, which tends to be much smaller and yeah, more price it conscious. It felt very Euro. Here. And so I think in that aspect, from everything that I've seen, I think they've actually put um, – They've done a good job of, of making the F Sport sporty instead of just a nameplate. I think Brian even uh, commented about that. But um, and bes- back seat's kind of tiny, but it's it's kind of a two person car. And despite the CVT, it does have one of the better CVTs out there. It does have yeah. their step. It's I, I guess they kind of have artificial steps in it's it or a ten something. Ten speed, ten steps, right, Brian? Yep. Yeah. So it's it's fun so, to drive. So if you're looking for. Um, Something in that line, uh, a subcompact uh, luxury SUV, you, you want something a little nicer than a Trax, uh, and for that matter, uh, a Buick Encore, uh, I think it's, uh, got a very, it's a very viable engine. I, I like it. One aspect I like better than the Encore is at least it's got a four-cylinder. Mm-hmm. So, Anywho, that is that. We also, sort of in a way, at the other end of the spectrum – although it's um, a little standout on, on its own, is the 2019 Chevrolet Blazer. Uh, here is a, a five-passenger SUV bringing back the Blazer name. Mm-hmm. It is uh, 
larger than an equinox, smaller than a traverse. It looks like really neither. It looks a lot like a Camaro, a very stylized, boxy, tall Camaro. Yeah. Um, my first impression was why, but I have to tell you, I really like driving it. Yeah, it's similar. When I heard they were bringing the Blazer back, I just wrongfully assumed that it would be based on the Colorado, sure. like rear wheel drive. I was like super jazzed frame. about yeah. that. I'm like, kind of like super just, jazzed. Yeah, kind of like, like the new, like, no, no, the new Bronco. Just like the new Bronco. Yeah. Well, yeah. Before, I want to see what super jazz Robinson is. Uh, yeah. Well, it didn't happen, so you can't <laughs> see it. So, uh, but then you know, once we saw the thing, uh, you know, realized it's on the same chassis as the Acadia and Traverse and all that uh, front wheel drive. Um, you know, yeah, it's a crossover. I got over yeah. pretty quickly, though. Uh, you know, when you see, like you say, it looks like the whole front end straight out the Camaro. Um, it sits low, it looks aggressive, and it drives really nice too. So, and no bed. one wants rear wheel drive truck like things anymore, anyway. So, well, you know, I, I think guess. we're all going to be sitting there watching to see how Ford does with the new Explorer there. Yeah. You know, except for towing, I'm not sure what the advantage is. Um, I will. I'd like to call out the fact that it's got a very Easier good lift. voice recognition system in it. Uh, mm-hmm. Surprising. We've been talking a lot about some of the more advanced systems and how well some of them work. And here's, um, you know, basically a mainstream brand. And most things that you threw at it that were just, you know, rudimentary, they worked very well. So I thought it did. Yeah. I don't. Um, I guess it's kind of like a two bird, one stone situation for Chevrolet because. As we know, and this is the thing amongst luxury manufacturers, is trying to fill every possible possible niche. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they are like slipping something in there that we wouldn't necessarily think would work. But between between uh, Equinox and uh, Traverse, and they get to bring back the Blazer name. So we were talking in the office about what this competes against, and I said I think it competes against the Nissan Murano. But do you know what it's aimed at? I would well I when we were having that conversation, I said the Edge, specifically the S T, the Ford Edge, because they redone that and then uh there's an R S version of the Blazer uh a lot sportier, clearly aimed uh, right at the edge. But do you know what Chevy says? Chevy no. says they're they're looking at luring customers away from the uh, uh Grand Cherokee. That's not going to happen. I don't think so. Either. No. Yeah. I mean, I shouldn't say it's not going to happen. It's they're not going to be coming in droves because that's a whole different animal. Yeah, they want yeah. the you know frame and rear wheel drive. Yeah, I don't know. Whenever I, I I wondered why they chose the name Blazer because when people like me think of Blazer, I think of like rusted out S10 Blazers oh, with geez. mismatched doors. <laughs> like I grew up with a lot of. There those are in my other people out there that remember so, them fondly, Joe. So I'm, uh, but but seeing it, seeing is believing. Uh, I think if they kind of try to market it as a four-door Camaro, yeah. the styling is there. I think yeah. that they could, I, they could go somewhere with that. The ride and handling there is, too, uh, yeah. is there, too. Actually, I thought it was really kind of athletic. And you know what else is there that we often don't talk about, uh, at least m- the public doesn't, is quality. Do you realize the recent uh, J.D. Power dependability survey that, survey that looks at three years' worth of uh, uh, dependable uh, vehicles they now rate Chevrolet as fourth and Buick fifth, and they're behind Lexus, Porsche, and Toyota. Chevy. Yeah, yeah. Chevy is. Chevy <laughs> I'm sure we'll see. What? I'm sure we'll, we'll see, see that lots of commercials. Yeah. We'll see lots of commercials. Oh, that's a Chevy? That's a Chevy. <laughs> oh, wait, I'm sorry. That's Buick. Sorry. Yeah. No, no, no. You're right. All right. Thanks very much, guys. Now let's move on to our viewer question for today. This is a pretty good one. We were sort of alluding to this earlier. I just watched a feature on Motor Week on alternative fuel stations, uh, places to basically put whatever you're running besides gasoline in it. Once you reach a station, how do you cool your heels while waiting for electric vehicles like Volt, Tesla, or others to recharge? What do you do for that hour to get if if you've got a fast charge station? Well, to... On the subject of all alternative fuel stations, stuff like hydrogen and, and, and biofuels and stuff, I mean, they're as they're quick, quick as it. gas. Exactly. Well, well, yeah, yeah, nom- nominally, driven, nominally, nominally driven, but not, not quite yeah, as quick, quite. but we're not talking about like minutes difference. Yeah. I was going to say, you drove the hydrogen. Yeah, they claim that it's as quick as gas, but it's not. No. Yeah. You still, it takes a little more care, and the yeah, nozzles are more complicated. Yeah, but to we're, use. we're not talking about waiting an hour for a know, battery, yeah. 75% battery charge. I'll tell you, the couple of times I've seen people waiting, they were just sitting in their cars uh, checking their emails on their yeah. tablets. YouTube kills time. Yeah. <laughs> or I'm not eat. sure what he's – I don't know if that's a line from the 
that Scriv wrote into that piece. I'm not sure. I'm not uh, familiar cool with the piece. Cool your heels. Yeah. No, that's just, I, imagine, I think that just means uh, like, yeah, what do you waiting. do to keep yourself most, busy? Most of them, uh, especially on interstates, are at a rest area. Just you know, where you can go hang out, have a picnic, go to a restaurant, and get something to eat. Get an I Auntie think, Anne's pretzel. Uh, yeah. I, I looked on the website to see if there was any kind of credentials to have one. Like, if you had to have a gas station nearby or some sort of like shopping center to do anything it didn't seem like it no, and some not. of the shots that we got looked like they were more industrial parks than like actual a lot of grocery stops. stores and drug stores have them and restaurants and motels and and but you know think about it say we were going down from our home in owings mills to savannah georgia it's 600 miles to Roebling Roads. Uh, that would probably be two stops. So it would add at least two hours to your trip if you found the right charging station. Okay, one of them you can probably eat. Maybe both of them you eat. I mean, that's one of the few things besides, you know, just basically playing with a tablet or a phone. So I think it's, a, I think it's an issue. I really do. I know Tesla has deliberately tried to locate their stuff near areas to eat or right. relax or do stuff. But uh, I know Porsche working on their fast charging stuff in Volkswagen. They're trying to get it down to like 15 minutes right. to do a 80 percent charge. So I think that's where you'll really see it become less of an issue. Is once you once you can get down from 30 minutes to 15 minutes to get your battery mostly charged. That's when it's less. Well, of an the issue. goal is for people like uh, Dyson, who does the vacuum cleaners. He's developing a you know his car is going to have a digital battery and it will be instantaneous. You basically plug it in, it's recharged. So we'll mm. see if that happens. And yeah. supposedly he's had some uh, success so far. The bigger issue, and this might even sneak into a rant or rave, which, mm. uh, you know, congratulations on the 200th podcast. I've never actually had a rant or a rave. <laughs> but awesome. uh, we, we mentioned <laughs> another earlier, first for today. We mentioned earlier the lack of full EVs, but a lot more plug-in hybrids. Mm -hmm. So at least in our area where I live, there's like one shopping center with charging stations. It has two chargers. And if you're in a full EV, and if I'm planning on sneaking in there and getting a charge, almost every time I go there, there's somebody with a plug-in hybrid. A uh, fusion energy. A, a fusion <laughs> energy, yeah, or a toy, a Prius plug-in or whatever, who doesn't need to use it, and they're both sitting there charging. And, you know, so if you get a full EV, you roll into a charging station, and they're all full, I'm not sure what you do with that. That's a real good point. Yeah. Do you think they'll switch it to, like, you have to be a full EV to use this spot, and then if you're not, you get cast <laughs> my, off my with all the expected mothers sure. and yeah, stuff yeah. like that. My guess is that the rapid charging, the stuff that's over 400 volts or whatever, my right. guess is that uh, plugins won't have they they won't have a fast charging plug it on a really plug in hybrid. They'll well, probably limit them to two forty or two twenty or whatever. But their battery is so small it wouldn't take that long anyway at that point. Right. So. And then you wind up with someone in a restaurant for forty minutes while their, you know, fusion energy is done charging, has been done charging for half an hour already and you're just sitting there waiting. I'm sure if we sat and thought about this, we could find out a lot more problems with this. But this is all what I think when we do Podcast 300, we may have some answers. I mean, if you're charging your Tesla, I'm sure you could just find somebody and talk about your Tesla for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, tes the Tesla forums are filled with charging etiquette. It's a whole world that I, you know. Yeah, but, what do, they, they all right, but what do they do about the non-Tesla owner who now can buy an adapter and mm -hmm. use their station? Like an illegal I know Chinese adapter and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, somebody so in California. I think developed it. Point. I'm I'm sure that I'm sure that Tesla is a lot like Apple in that they'll find a way to release a new plug that you have to buy. You know, their car special or, access uh, to yeah. use, or it'll just and, detect the uh, yeah. adapter and then not let it charge. And eject you. <laughs> yeah, it'll eject you. So. All right, let's move on. Uh, we actually we're up to our rant raves. Brian, do you actually have one? Oh, that was it. It was, was the mild. One. It that counts. Was a good one. It mild. counts. That one. Feel free if someone's got something better to I, chime in. Mine is annoying, and it has nothing to do with aggression. Usually, when I'm talking about bad driving behaviors, I'm talking about somebody being overly aggressive and just annoying the, the jeebies out of me. <laughs> but I just did a 1,200 mile up and down the East Coast run, and I was in a car, not an SUV, low to the ground, fairly innocuous. And I was struck by the number of people that tailgate both in the city and the highways. And these are not people that want you to get out of the way. 
it seems to be increasingly just a normal way of driving because when you get over, they don't pass. Yeah, so like you say you're in the right lane right. and then they're like right up on you and the left lane is completely open to right. move around right. they just don't. Uh, or they you just... pull over and they sit there, so now they're in your blind spot. Right. And I give them usually about 20 seconds and then I just nail it to get – yeah. Yeah. That's what I like to envision, yeah. John yeah. Davis. Just oh, I full throttle. I fully believe in using the accelerator, but you know, you ninety seconds is all it takes. Ninety feet, rather, you travel ninety feet in one second at sixty miles an hour. That's three car lengths, basically plus. So, if the person behind you is one second late in hitting the brakes, if you hit the brakes, they're not just in your rear; they're ahead of you. Yeah. So. Is it people aren't getting trained? Is no one paying attention? It just seems to be prevalent. And it doesn't even seem to be age-specific. People don't even uh, – they just don't pay attention. I'm not sure if they teach it well or not. But even on two-lane roads, you know, you'll see at nighttime people riding right on people's tails right. uh, in two-lane roads. And I'm like, wow, that's – All it takes insane. is one deer to cause like sure. a three-car pileup. Yeah. Or to put you in the you know in traction for the rest of your life. So anyway, if you catch yourself um, – Maybe being a little too close so that you can't see the taillights of the car ahead of you. Uh, you know, back off a little bit. After all, you're not only uh, protecting the, yourself here, basically maybe keeping your insurance rates reasonably low and hopefully not causing somebody else lots of damage and injury. Okay. Is that it? Anybody have anything else they want to throw in? Uh, 200? I'm good. Joe? Here's to the next Jim 200. Bigwood, any closing comment? May we be fortunate enough to record 200 more. All right. Well, we wrap up Motor Week podcast number 200. I want to thank everybody, Brian Robinson, Greg Carlos, Joe Ligo, Jim Bigwood, for being a part of this uh, momentous occasion. Uh, And I mentioned earlier our podcast creator, Bob Mixter, and, of course, Jim back there making us all sound halfway literate. We hope that you have a chance to listen to more of our podcasts and to actually watch Motor Week on your public television stations around the country and also on the Motor Trend cable network. If you're wondering where to watch us, you can go to our website, motorweek.org, do the pull down at the top, put in your zip code or your city and find out what public television station is airing us near you and when. Anything else, Greg? Greg's our social media guru. Keep Keep watching our retro reviews. Yeah. Watch us on YouTube. Keep basically following us on Twitter and Facebook. Uh, If you are out there interested in cars, we're there to help. I'm John Davis. For all of us at MotorWeek, thanks very much for joining us, and we'll talk to you soon. You've been listening to the podcast of MotorWeek, television's original automotive magazine. MotorWeek is made possible by TireRack.com, WeatherTech, RockAuto.com, and State Farm. For additional information on podcasts, videos, and showtimes, visit our website at MotorWeek.org. And watch MotorWeek, television's longest-running automotive magazine series, each week on your local PBS station. 